Yo, 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 yo. What's good, what's good, what's good, what's good, man? Yes, sir. Just making sure we're good here. We good? Yo, 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 man. What is good? What is good? What is good, man? How was everybody's weekend, man? What up, early gang? No coffee gang, power shortage gang. What's that mean? No hood, the, the, the hoodie tar. Oh, yeah, this is a Billy Racks hoodie, man. This is uh, some Billy Racks merch. I've been having this. I had this for a minute. Um, it's the first time wearing it, though. Um, pay my electric bill type coffee. That new, yeah, yeah, this is, oh, I mean, I've had it, I've had it for a minute, but, uh, this is the first time I, uh, I've actually worn it. Man, I can't find my team producer guard hoodie, bro. I gotta, um, I gotta get another one, man. I've been, I don't know what the hell happened to it. I've been searching for it, searching, uh, far and wide. Uh, yeah, hit that like, man. Appreciate you, Prism. Man, I feel like it's been a long weekend. I feel like I haven't seen you guys in, in a long time, even though it's been a couple of days. Let me pour up my coffee. We got a dope episode today, man. We got something new, man. We got uh, definitely got a new type of guest here today, man. We got a Grammy Award winning mastering engineer named Mike Bozy. He's here today, man. Um, let me pull up my notes. Let me pull up my notes. See, we got him in the waiting room here. Uh, also, too, I encourage you guys to tap in for live q and I think this, I'm, I mean, I know this is going to be a, a really dope one for live Q&A. Uh, you guys know early game. We've never had a uh, mastering engineer on the show. So it's really dope to get him on here. Let me get my notes in the correct area. Boom. Oh, uh, man. But this guy, uh, let me pull up his IG. Let me just show you guys. So you guys can go tap in and follow him. Uh, screen share, screen share, screen share. What are we doing? What are we doing? There we go. Screen share, screen share. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, uh, man. So, yeah, go definitely give him a follow. Mastered by Mike on IG. Simple enough. This man, uh, like I said, is a Grammy Award winning mastering engineer. His credits, uh, the range of his credits is crazy. It goes all the way back from like Prince and Janet Jackson uh, to Dr. Dre, Eminem, Kendrick Lamar, and then, you know, as of recently, Roddy Rich uh, and more. Um, very, very dope. Uh, he works at the world-renowned Bernie Grundem Mastering Studio in Hollywood. Uh, it's actually probably the most world-renowned mastering studio in the world, and has been. Uh, they've been involved in projects, uh, you know, all the way from Thriller, Michael Jackson, to Prince, Purple Rain, Dr. Dre, The Chronic. Really legendary credits, really legendary albums uh, mastered out of this studio, and, you know, they continue to, uh, you know, work on big big records you know what i mean uh if you if you take a look at this guy's credits you know big records you know um post malone and uh race remord and just uh you know the, uh, he, he did the um pretty sure he did the sunflower record man he did uh did a whole bunch of uh, dope stuff man i'll um, definitely encourage you guys to check this guy out um definitely give him a follow but uh before we bring him in here man what's going on with the what's going on with the game yeah, this is crazy. Shout out to Leno too. Leno brought it to my attention. He's like, yo, bro, how would you feel about getting a mastery engineer? You know, I know we never got one on. I was like, hell yeah, let's do it. And, uh, you know, who better to get on than uh, the world famous Mike Bosey? Yeah, Prince, Michael Jackson, the, you know, the, this, uh, the, this, this studio, you know, they mastered the Michael Jackson Thriller album, which is probably arguably like the biggest album in like music history. Hey, I appreciate it, guys. Okay, we got 113 gang members in here. Let's go, let's go. Um, but you guys know the drill, man. You guys know the drill. We can't bring in a guest without a warm welcome, man. Please blow up that chat. 100 emojis, gem emojis, fire emojis. I need to see it all, man. I'm going to bring him in. Yeah, man. Let's see gold emojis. Let's see. Let's see everything. Let's 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 blow it up. Blow it up. Blow it up. Blow it up. Uh, where are we 
at? Where we at? Where we at? Where we at? Bring Mike Bosey in here. Mike Bosey. Yo, yo. Hey, what's going on, man? How you doing? Doing well, man. Yourself? Um, it's early. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know you're over on the West Coast, so it's 7 a.m. Are you usually up this early or not? Yeah, but I'm not really lucid. <laughs> you're not here. You may, you may be up this early, but you're not usually active this early. But uh, yeah, That's man. right. I just so, just okay. starting with the coffee, so... Yes, sir. Cheers, coffee sir. gang. Yes, sir. Cheers, yeah, yeah. man. Coffee, coffee gang. Early gang. Oh, uh, man. Uh, pleasure to have you on the show today, man. Um, this is, uh, you know, first of a kind episode for us. The first time we've had a mastering engineer on the show. And uh, we got we got uh, we got a crazy amount of good questions for you, man. We hopefully you can give us some insight on the mysteries of, uh, of mastering. You know what I mean? So something that we, uh, you know, uh, as as producers, you know, uh, sometimes mastering is a simple. Well, most of the time, mastering for us is as simple as throwing a soft clipper on the uh, master channel of our FL studio. Or sometimes we get well, into a little. I know. <laughs> yeah, uh, and well, I want to talk about that too. I want to talk about you know your theories or you know your the facts on why soft clippers sound so good. And I want to get into all that kind of stuff, man. Do want to talk about your story? But I guess a great first place to start out this episode would be, man, in your best definition what uh how would you describe mastering what is mastery oh god all right well i mean mastering is really two things it's it started out um mastering guys were called mastering engineers they were basically transferring information from tape to tape so you'd record you know this is like pre-70s right you'd record right. On the tape, and at that time, the only format to listen to music on was a record. So you were trying to either transfer from tape to vinyl or from tape to tape. And it was pretty much a straight across the board transfer without any kind of creative anything, right? Yeah. And then kind of late 60s, early 70s, it turned into a more creative artistic thing where mastering engineers sweeten the sound a little bit. And I think since then it's just turned into, you know, more and more mastering people are having, you know, their hands on the final product, but in general mastering, um, it's the creative part, which is, you know, trying to optimize sound, right? Dynamics, EQs, volumes. Um, but then there's kind of the secretarial part of it where you're delivering an actual master with metadata and, you know, it's quality controlled by our studio and we stand by all that stuff. So when it goes out to DSPs or wherever, the integrity of the files, the integrity of the master is, is accounted for. Um, but it's also kind of, it's, you know, the last gasp a lot of times. It's the last chance to change things. Uh, edits mixes you know oh we're gonna throw a guy a feature on this when you're done the album so like you're kind of the guy that takes all the puzzle pieces throws them together shoots it out to the world i mean that's kind of the the basic idea right right and now mastering mastering is always done on just like the final master uh master wave file it's never like uh like a multi-track you never tr uh master like multi-tracks or anything like that um, I'm, I'm sure you could. I haven't. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm usually just mastering, you know, a stereo bounce interleaved or dual mono Pro Tools file or whatever you've got. I mean, people ask to master stems and I can master from stems, but individually mastering stems doesn't really make sense because you're, there's nothing to relate it to. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm basically just dealing with a two track or a, a stereo bounced dual mono dope dope man so yeah i want to definitely get into more of the 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 technical stuff and i got plenty of good questions and that we're going to bring in some guys for uh live q a we'll add them to the zoom call too um i don't know if you know we're actually we're live right now i don't know if you were uh you know the show is live so we got uh we got about 170 people tuned in so we'll bring in some of those sure. guys at the end for uh, some live q a but man i want to hear more about your story man i want to hear you know how uh just your 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 love for music started and how you got into you know specifically mastering but take us all the way to back to the beginning man Ooh, 
Oh, all right. Well, <laughs> even before I was born, I was probably into it. Um, <laughs> my my folks were in a in a folk group in the '60s together. My dad played bass and my mom sang. Okay. Um, then they had kids and had to get real jobs. So my <laughs> my dad, we were living on the East Coast at the time. My dad got a job in radio. Um, right around the time I was born and, uh, was working out in New York, I think for NBC at the time, their local radio station kind of faked his way into the gig, told him he knew what he was doing and he had no idea, but they were building a studio. So while they were building the studio, he learned how to be a program director and then moved to LA when I was really young. So I've always been around it. He worked out here in LA at K Earth. He was a program director here. We moved uh, across the river from Detroit to Windsor, Ontario. He was a program director there. Mm -hmm. So I was always around music, going to radio stations. He also produced a lot of local music in Detroit. So we'd go to garage studios and, you know, this is all in the eighties. Um, and it was kind of a, well, late seventies, early eighties, and it was always around. So I think I, I kind of figured I would always fall into it too. I really never had any other aspirations. I just didn't know what the thing was going to be. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, after high school, I just started taking jobs that were music related. Like they didn't, they weren't necessarily, Hey, I want to be in an industry. Um, like my, my second job was working at the Greek theater out here just, you know, as an usher, but it got me around live music. And then I worked at retail and that got me around that side of things, the sales and promotion and marketing and music. Did you have like a, a set goal, like a long-term goal or like an ultimate kind of thing? Not at all. Like I, I was treading water to be honest with you. Okay. Um, just, you know, when you're in your late teens, you can kind of, fuck up a little bit and decide what works for you. Right. And I think, you know, looking back, this was all just kind of like shuffling through the deck to see what stuck, like what, what's of interest. Um, fast forward a few years, my, my dad had worked for A&M records, um, in the Michigan area. It's a trip cause we used to drive past like the Motown house of hits on yep. the way to work all the time. So like just all these little weird things were ingrained in your head as a kid that seemed perfectly normal that if you're not into music, you'd be like, holy shit, there's Motown. And we were just like, hey, there's that cool house. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, where did I leave off? High school. Oh, so my dad stopped working at a label, started his own little jazz label. And I was unemployed at the time. We were working out of the house. I was shipping stuff from the garage, you know, calling radio stations to get music played. That really didn't pan out <laughs> for, for either of us. But again, it was just another angle of the industry to check out. Mm -hmm. um, and I found myself in a real shit place. Um, I'd taken a trip to Europe, thank God, which sort of changed my life just as far as like, man, focus. You know what I mean? Like try and figure out what you're going to do at this time. I was 20. That was, was just like a, like a, like a find yourself kind of trip. It wasn't like music related. Yeah. Either. I mean, it ended up being that because after high school, like I, I growing up where I grew up in Canada, like you just graduated high school and you either went to a bigger city or you stayed in Windsor, which was like the industrial capital of Canada. And a lot of my friends were just like, well, I'll go work for Ford or GM or Chrysler or whatever. And, you know, I, not to say that that's, you know, not noble, whatever you do for a living is what you do for a living. Yeah. Um, I just knew that I didn't want to do that. And luckily we moved back to LA right at the beginning of high school for me. So, um, anyway, up after high school, like, I, I didn't know what an SAT was until, <laughs> until my senior year. Like it was never really, my parents didn't put pressure on me to like, what college are you going to? Mm. Cause they didn't really know about it either. Um, mm. So I ended up going to junior college, which was literally the street over from my high school. And I was already taking high school classes at the college. So even in junior college, I was taking broadcasting classes and, and just, 
things that were interesting. I didn't care about, you know, English, math, literature, like those, those were the prerequisites, but they weren't anything I was interested in. Okay. Um, and then towards, you know, the end of my first broadcasting class, which I didn't really show up for either. Um, you know, my teacher was like, why are you here? And then I kind of told him, um, backtrack a second before I worked as a mastering engineer, my last job was stripping wallpaper off of rich people's walls in their bathrooms. I, yeah. I drove a 70 Camaro from the Valley here down to long beach, which when you drive a 70 Camaro that gets eight miles to the gallon, you're basically working for gas money. So that was just, you know, I'm making $30 a day. This is bullshit. Yeah. Eight um, miles to the gallon. That's crazy. <laughs> anyway. So like, my, my professor at the time was like, what do you want to do? Like, why are you in my class? And mm -hmm. I said, I'm already kind of working where I wanted to work because I just started working at Bernie Kremen Mastering. And when he, he heard the studio name, he's like, why are you taking this class? Like he was impressed by where I was just starting to work. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that was kind of an early indicator that this might be a good idea <laughs> at least. Um, but yeah, I mean, I fell into being a mastering engineer, to be honest with you. I had no engineering experience. I've never mixed a song in my life. Uh, I played drums for a while in my garage band with my brother and friends, and we record on a four track cassette tape, but like that was it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that, that just kind of led to an opportunity um, to work at Bernie Grumman Mastering, which, you know, not to toot our own horn, but I will, um, <laughs> like Bernie's known worldwide. He's, you know, if you, if you were to give a list of the best mastering guys ever, he's in the top five. I mean, and that's not because he's my boss. Go look at the numbers, go look at what he's done and the respect yeah. within the industry. So I knew like I'm stepping into the pros, like it, it's, it was a weird experience. Like I had a very basic job, entry level job, but I knew that the reputation of the studio was great. And that if I could find a way, you know, like everybody wants to find their way in the door, maybe this could be a thing. So that was, that was kind of the quick story of the first 22 years. <laughs> yeah. But, um, so you started off as just like an intern or like an assistant engineer kind of thing? What were well, they, did, they, never, they didn't have interns at the time. Um, okay. I'd heard about the gig through family. Um, the two entry-level jobs were tape librarian, which was basically, I mean, this is, this is back before digital. So we were still working with a lot of tape and dats were relatively new. Um, so we were, we, you could either be the tape librarian where you're logging in people's tapes, sending them back to labels, sending them back to artists, or you could be the QC guy. And the QC guy basically sat around listening to music all day. I mean, shit, I was doing that for free at home. So, I mean, it's a little bit more than that. You were doing data entry and, and you know, some secretarial things, but you were listening to music before it came out. You were kind of the proofer if you were a proofreader, if you were writing. Uh, and you would just take notes and send them back to the mastering guy. Hey, I, I hear a distortion here, or is this click supposed to be here? You know, just shit like that. They could yeah. check against the master before we sent them out. And, and I started that working nights, like part-time. So it was kind of just getting your toes in the water to see what this thing is but again like they were paying me to listen to music all day i'd take that job today if i were unemployed <laughs> you know what i mean so yeah. um and then i lucked out because the guy who was the full-time qc guy like six months after i started in there decided he was gonna move out of town and they offered me that full-time gig of course i'm gonna take that full-time gig um <laughs> did that for like another year. Um, and it, it's, it was repetitive. I was good at it, but it was very repetitive. It, but it taught me at that very early stage, like a different way to listen to music. Cause 
I don't know if this is going to make sense, but it was teaching yourself to listen inside the music. So you're not really, I don't care what you're saying. I don't care how dope the beat is. You're trying to listen to inside that mix, inside that mastering. Is there anything that stands out as wrong? So I was training my ears before I knew I was training my ears. Mm. Um, anyway, that, that guy who had the full-time gig split and they offered me that job and I took it, did it for a year. And then like in mastering, there's not a lot of turnover. Um, and specifically to our studio, like everybody who's there today, other than a couple front office people, like everybody's been there over 20 years. So like, you're not, you're not for hire, like a mix engineer is gonna bounce from studio to studio, like mastering people, boom, we're doing this right here. It's not a mobile service. I don't go to somebody else's studio and master. Um, is it important because you gotta, you gotta really have your ear t tuned to the room? Yeah, like I've on? only mastered in my room. So I don't know what I'd be like mastering at home or in somebody else's rig or through somebody else's gear. Yeah. Um, anyway, so after that dude left, I did that for about a year. And then Brian Gardner, who is my mentor, who if you know anything about hip hop music, specifically West Coast hip hop, he was the dude. Like his, his nickname was Big Bass Brian. Um, and his assistant engineer was moving to Nashville to open his own studio. And they, they offered me that gig. And, and I remember the studio manager at the time was like, Hey, do you want, do you want to move up and be an assistant engineer? You'll have to work nights, you know, all the laid out all the negatives, of course. And I said, I literally don't know what anything in that room does. And I didn't like, I didn't know what any of the, anything did. I couldn't turn on shit. Right. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, I would take the gig because there's no telling when you'll get this opportunity again. Mm. And if there's one thing that this industry and anybody listening can take away, that is to say yes to every opportunity. Hopefully you're prepared for it. But I just always said yes. Like, okay, I'll, I'll figure it out. You'll tell me if I'm shitty at it because you won't keep me employed. Yeah. Um, but there was like a six month layover between that guy leaving and me being the full time second. So I learned a lot in that time, but it was also, again, a different era. There was no digital audio workstation. So if you if you ate somebody's tape or you screwed up their dat, like you were kind of screwed mm -hmm. unless they had a backup or something like that. Did and you ever do that? I did it once. <laughs> <laughs> you only do it once and then you learn your lesson. Um, but like, it was just labor intensive, like to make an album that's an hour long, like it's hard to explain to somebody who wasn't around in those times, but the medium type that masters were made was a, it was a digital audio tape. It looked like a big VCR tape Okay. and half that tape had a video track and the other half was audio Okay. and you'd stripe it with time code and you would basically assemble an album with punch-ins, right? You'd guess where the next song should start and in hip hop, obviously you want things to be in tempo or on beat or like come in right after the end, last note of the track before. Um, but you really couldn't tell if you got it right until you recorded it and went back and checked that spot. So it just took three times, four times as long as it does now mm. to get masters done. But I'm thankful because I learned how to cut tape. I learned how to line tape machines. I learned that era. I'm glad it's over for the most part because it, it's a lot, you know, like probably learn some patience too, huh? Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm also one of those guys that learns from making mistakes. Like I was never afraid to make mistakes. It was just like, I think early on, I recognized the sacrifice it would take to learn how to do something. If that meant my eight hour shift was a 12 hour shift, then that's what it was. You know, like mm. you, you just do what you got to do. But I think. Were you having you fun know, with it or would it, were you, was it more of a job? I mean, I was, I'm always having fun with it. Like mm. it's really easy for me to bring it back to the most simplest thing. Like I still do that. I get like, I, I get paid to do shit. I love 
And it's like, that's real. It, I, I grew to love aspects of it, but I always loved music. So the fact that I ended up doing what I kind of always figured I'd be in in some regard, I won, right? For a guy who dropped out of junior college three times, I feel like I won. I don't drive a Lamborghini. I don't, you know, I don't make bread like other guys do, but I have fun and I, I listen to new artists and new music before anybody gets to hear it. That alone is dope. You know, but yeah. like, you know, I've been in it a little over 25 years now and I realize like how small our industry is. You think it's like, oh, those cats over there don't know these people over here. Like everybody knows everybody or is one or two degrees away from everybody. Like I'm on your show because of David Kim. Yeah. <laughs> I, Shout out to you David know, Young Kim. Yeah. And, and Lena, who I met at NAM. Hey. Shout out to Lano so, too, man. So like these connections that you think maybe might just be a one-off meeting, like I think I just take all of those now as shit, I might see you, I might see you a year from now or six months from now or five years from now down the road. Um that part of it's really cool, man. Like, I don't know. I'm I'm big on not just the work part of it. I like the personal part of it. Like I like knowing my clients. I like having people in the room. And I think amongst mastering engineers, that's not always the case. Like I, most pros that I know would rather work alone. They're more productive. You get things done quicker and you do, but there's an element missing. Like you're writing off mastering as just this last thing that happens. And I don't really have a say. And to me, I think the product's better when you have a, you know, a give and take, if it's just with the mixer, you know, like the artist is going to hear it and approve it. The label is going to hear it and approve it. I work on my relationships with A&R people and mix engineers. Like I know you're, you know, this is a producer's channel, mm -hmm. but producers aren't seeking me out. Mix engineers are seeking me out and labels are seeking me out and right. sometimes artists, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm big on that. Because it has, it has to mean more, I think, than just, I did this job and I made blank amount of money. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Off that job. And that's that. And who cares if they come back? Like, I want to foster relationships with people so I can do this, not just myself for a long time, but I think you build a relationship with certain engineers. They know what you do, you bring to the table, and then you put those things together. And sometimes it, it it kills. And I have that luckily with a couple mix engineers that trust me enough with their stuff that we've had really big success with. Um, but that I also know like how many kids you have. I know that your mom was sick. I know that, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I just feel like that personal contact part of this business and to really take it all the way back to the beginning part of watching my father move in those worlds when I was a kid, I didn't really remember the concerts that I went to. I remember watching my dad shaking hands and talking with people and having a cocktail and doing the business part of it, but it looked like it was fun. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. You're really working, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think I'm, I, I also am bringing a little bit of that and trying to keep it, you know, keep that going between people because as technology's progressed, even in my time in the business, it's easy to never see somebody. You know what I mean? Like, especially now, uh, quarantine. <laughs> I'll give you for instance, I've mastered three Post Malone albums. I, I've never met the A&R guy. I met Post Malone after I won a Grammy under the stage at the Grammys for like 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And I've not met anybody else in that camp, but we've had great success. Mm -hmm. And then there's people like Kendrick or Tyler, where I know Ali and Neil Pogue pretty well. You know what I mean? And and the whole team at TVE and and the whole team of Tyler's. So um, I think knowing a little bit beyond just like, Hey, that's a dope artist. And I want to get that credit. You know what I mean? Like I want to look back 
whenever the industry tells me I'm done and say like, I didn't just do it for the clout or do it to make some money or to say, I want a Grammy. Like I made friendships, you yeah, know, for sure. man. Yeah. I mean that, I think that that's big gem right there. The relationship I was just in the, uh, you know, this, this past week we had the team in town and we were doing a lot of content and, uh, you know, we had a bunch of producers and stuff that we've had on the podcast pull up and, um, you know, particularly one that I haven't seen in a while. He's like, Hey man, he's like, yo, we got to go out. We got to grab some food sometime. You know what I mean? It's, it's deeper than this music shit. You know what I mean? We just gotta, we just gotta kick it. We've got to, you know what I mean? Chop it up, you know, figure out some other plays and stuff. So I think that, yeah, never, never sleep on the relationships and, and never, never think, I don't think you should ever think you're bothering people. If you, if you, if you're at least trying to be friendly and trying to, you know, talk about more than just business all the time or. Um, oh, no or, doubt. I mean, I, 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 uh, I, I feel like because I'm a little bit older, probably than most people watching your show, like I feel it's my job and, and it, I'm not the best mastering guy in the world. I'm a mastering guy in the world who's worked with some big names. Right. Mm. But um, some of the younger engineers and artists I know are coming to me just on the side, aside from the work that we do together, like with some real shit. Like I think kind of what your show's about, like they're, it's not all roses out there. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of internal struggle. There's a lot of questioning yourself. I think that that sh I question myself every day. I do this every day, but I still question myself. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, and I think that those things only come when you've got those relationships. Like I don't, I don't need to go get drinks with you and go to the club, but like, you want to come over and chill out for lunch for a minute and just like vent your frustrations and like maybe get a little positive energy back or just yeah. some sympathy or like, bro, I, I know what that is. Um, cause I know what that is before I got the room that I work in right now. Um, I was an assistant for 20 years, 20 years is a long time. Hell yeah. To you yeah. know what I mean? And I started in my early 20s, so I was watching all my friends going out, doing shit. Like, Mike, when you want to link up, like, you want to hang out, we're going to this club, or we're going to go see this band, or you want to come over and smoke some weed? Like, no, I got to be at work, right? And as a, as a young engineer, that's, it's a hard priority to make if that shit's important to you. That was never important to me, like setting myself up because I had no education, because I had no permanent job that I could see had longevity. I was like, this is like, I'm going for it. Like whatever it takes, I'm going to do that. And I'm still that way. Like, I don't like working weekends. Mastering guys are pretty much 10 to six and then you're gone. But I have you know, people that'll call me like, Hey, it's Sunday afternoon. Can you knock this out for me? And like, well, can it wait till tomorrow morning? No. Yeah. All right. Put on my shoes and head down to the studio. Like I still have the grind I had when I was 20 because hopefully what I've built over that span of time is the expectation of those people that Mike's going to deliver, you know, like, what is it under promise and over deliver? Like that's me to a T. And that was me as an assistant. Like I wanted there to never be doubt that my part of the process was going to be taken care of and taken care of properly. Um, and I think that for young engineers, like you have to set the bar for yourself before anybody else sets that bar for you. Right. I know Bernie Grumman is happy with the engineer I've become, but I hold myself to a standard that's even above like what he is to the industry. Like I work with a legend, so I'm, my bar is way up here. You know what I mean? Versus I'm cool because I've done some shit, right? Well, I work with guys who've done a ton more shit than me. Mm -hmm. So it's a humbling place to work. It's not like they, hold that over your head and make you feel like you haven't done anything. But the minute you think you've got it figured out or that you don't have to work as hard because you think you've figured it out, you're screwed. 
in my right. opinion. Like I don't I don't ever want to be mailing shit in. You know what I mean? And the people who are repeat customers, the labels that are repeat customers, like those people know they can call me and if they got to have it, I'll make it happen. And I like that. Like, I like that responsibility. I don't have an assistant. I'm, I'm the guy. So I, I do the mastering and the production end of things out of my room. And I like that because if shit is fucked up, it's my fault. And if shit is great, it's me. Like yeah. I'll, I'll take all that. I'm not afraid of that. Um, it's and in, and it makes you work harder. There's nobody else to blame but you. So <laughs> what, what are you gonna do? Yeah, I hear that. I definitely hear that, man. Super dope, man. Um, great. Like you know, just like you know, overall life gems and and uh, especially the the relationship gems and stuff like that. Um, so when when you when you uh before we get into the technical stuff you know seeing that you know you were like this young guy that you know uh all of a sudden was just thrown into this world of you know one of the uh you know greatest you know mastery engineers one of the greatest you know world renowned studios um to to do this kind of stuff for guys that have opportunities to be around people that are are in the industry doing it legends whatever um what's like what's the best advice you could give for like you know seeking asking questions and, and, and just trying to, you know, tap into their knowledge and tap into, you know, just that, that kind of stuff. Right. Well, I mean, I think it's a little different from, from what I'm doing, but it probably, you know, you can transfer this to to whatever you're doing. Um, like the guy I worked for Brian, I'll back it up in high school, my senior year of high school and you have NWA, came out with straight out of Compton. Right. Okay. And me and all my friends in high school, a diverse group of dudes would just cruise bumping that out of my friend's Honda Accord day in and day out, cruise Mulholland, smoke a bowl and pretend I was MC Ren and you were easy E and you were ice (laughs) shit. And then I went to work for the engineer who mastered straight out of Compton and was working with Dre and then worked with Snoop and then worked with Pac and then worked with 50 Cent and then worked with Eminem. So an easy and bone thugs and like all the offshoots of all those labels, right. Mm -hmm. As a second. And I was not in the room, right. They're in the room with the headmastering guy. I'm showing up at five in the afternoon, maybe an hour before my shift starts um, to try and, you know, check in with him. Is there anything I need to know about this session? But in those times I wasn't really talking to artists. Like that was kind of my, my place. Like I'm not, I'm not to go in the room. I'm not to really engage with anybody. I'm just the production guy. Right. But then I figured out as the production guy, it wasn't important for me to know the artist. It was important for me to know the management. It was important for me to know the A&R guy because the person that's going to call you at 10 PM and say, Hey, can I get an instrumental for 50 cents in the club? They're going to ask for me. They're not going to ask for Brian. Brian's at home. You know what I mean? He's checked out, had dinner, watching TV. Um, So having those insights really only after time and trying to figure out like, how am I going to get my name out there as well is to make those connections with those people. Whereas I think a mixed person, you, you probably want to know producers, you want to know artists. So, um, paying attention. And, and it was funny. I watched David Kim's video last night just to see what I was in for. (laughs) And, and, and he had it right. Like when you're in a room and you're not the guy, shut up. Mm. And, and keep your ears and your eyes open. You learn a lot being around the room, not necessarily in the room. Like it was cool meeting those people after their session on the way out. Like my boss was cool about introducing me to Dre, introducing me to Pac, introducing me to Snoop. But like, I wasn't like, here's my number. Call me. (laughs) Call me any mastering production work. (laughs) Um, But the label person would, keep calling you and you're like, wow, I keep talking to blank over at Interscope or, or somebody over at Priority. I need to know them so they know to call for me. 
Mm-hmm. And I think over the course of time, like before, before Brian retired, I was already mastering stuff, right? Like we were kind of like parallel mastering, but I was still doing his production. But um, since he's left, like those connections that I made way back when with guys who were even A&R assistants who are now heads of A&R, like people, that's what I said earlier, like everybody kind of knows everybody. Hmm. So the guy who was, you know, the intern for the A&R guy, or, Hey, this is my assistant, whoever that guy in a year might be the VP of A&R at a label. You don't know. Right. So kind of trying to know as many people who are affiliated with the project who aren't the artist, I guess it was a good move for me. And it's proven to be a good move because when he left and they called a book session, they say, well, he retired, but Mike's here and Mike took the room over and there's a comfort, right? Oh, I know Mike. Well, let's give him a shot. You know, like, I feel like I, I still have to reprove myself to people. And there's some, there's a funny story in there with Neil Pogue about that. But like, I think it all kind of falls back to wanting to hold up the reputation, right? Like he set the standard to me and to a lot of DJ friends of mine for hip hop mastering and cutting vinyl. Like I have friends that spun vinyl who could tell what he mastered just by the grooves right in the records they're oh, like wow. yeah i knew that before i even looked at the label yeah. and i'm like wow that's crazy right and and he had such an imprint on west coast rap la rap to the bay like taking over that room to me was like i need to continue that legacy for him i need to continue that legacy for me i need to continue that legacy for the studio mm. and Interestingly enough, the thing that put me on and got my name into the world was Big Mad City for Kendrick, which he originally mastered. And then he went to Vegas one weekend and Ali called me with changes that weekend. They had to turn it in on a Monday. Well, I had the relationship with Ali because I was doing production and he knew that I was the production guy. He said, well, it's got to get done. I called Brian in Vegas. What do you want me to do? He's like, well, handle it. So I ended up mastering, remastering four or five songs on that album and then kind of forgot about it. Like I was stoked that it was a Dre produced album at the time, but like we've done thousands of albums. It's another album. You know what I mean? And then when Grammy nominations came out that year, like my name was on TV as a mastering guy. I didn't even know I got a credit on that album, Uh let alone get a nomination from it. So that was, you know, really just kind of like the jump off point for me. And then TDE saw that hustle in me. I did Schoolboy Q after that. I did an, I did To Pimp a Butterfly after that. I did another Schoolboy Q album, which led to a SZA album, which led to, you know, TDE. So, um, I, and, and and oddly enough, I see TDE kind of like what death row was earlier, right? It's just another generation's version of that, maybe without all the drama, but like a label coming out of LA representing LA with an artist who is on the level of a Snoop for the times, you know what I mean? Or, or a pop for the times. Um, so like, that was my introduction to, well, who's this, who's this Mike Bozy guy, right? Um, but like every day I go into work trying to beat myself, beat my mentor, impress the studio, hopefully impress the client, impress the world. (laughs) You know what I mean? But like, not like it's a power trip. It's just a cool feeling. Like when you when you do anything and then you see the repercussions of that, whether it's played on the radio or played in a club or you pull up next to a car playing a song you mastered, like that's, that's cool shit. You know, I I think, and again, mastering guys don't make a shit ton of money. I mean, some of them probably do. This one doesn't. (laughs) So you got to, so you, so you got to pull, 
you got to pull those things out, you know, that are pleasurable for you and that drive you. Like for me right now, like I want longevity, right? Like people, people will look at shit like that, a plaque, right? Or an award or a Grammy. Let me show Whether you real quick. It, I got to, I got to move the screen over so they can see. There yeah, no worry. You got to see that um, Grammy right there. So like, Aside from a Grammy, which is great, and I'm not going to shit on that because I always wanted a Grammy, and I've got one. Now I, it's not like I want forty of them. I wait. I take that back. I want forty of them. But <laughs> if I don't get forty of them, like I want longevity. I want to do this until I decide I don't want to do this anymore. Right. So like these awards and shit that people get, they're dope, and it and it does bring you work. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like it's a calling card, just like anything else. And I can always say I'm a Grammy winning mastering guy, but like that is this much of like a career that is this big, you know? So it's, it's great, but like, you can't sit back on that and be like, cool. I'm, I'm, I'm golden. Cause I got my trophy. No, dude, you got to show up and be better than you were yesterday. And mm-hmm. tomorrow I want to be better than I'm going to be today. And that's, Again, back to that original driving thing. I think people are cut out for this. If you don't, if you don't give yourself excuses, you'll do good, you know. But if you if you try and cut a corner or you look for the shortcuts all the time, or like that morning you're just not feeling it, you still got to go. You still got to get in there and do your thing. Like people are paying you to do that, so show up and get it done. Hundred percent, man. Yeah, I, I know I just tangented off into a weird... No, no, you're good, man. No, it's it's it's, 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 it's a good conversation, uh, much needed. A lot of people need to hear that. Um, I want to get into some technical stuff, and I know there's some guys in the waiting room that definitely want to get into some technical stuff too. I see Steve's. I see you, man. Steve has been absent, man. I haven't seen Steve's in a minute, but as soon as he sees uh, that we got Mike Bozy, mastering engineer in here, he pops back in. He's a he's an engineer that watches our show or tunes into our show, big supporter. So I know I know he'll 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 come. In. I will tell you, I am not the most technical guy in the world, but I will answer what I can. Um, yeah. To me, like it's a, it's a feel thing. Like I, it, it's funny. I I would always ask Brian through the years. Like, I mean, I, I've stolen all the tricks I can from him, right? But I know that he didn't tell me everything. Um, and again, because I didn't go to school for this, I don't understand a lot of what's happening underneath the top of my console. Right. Yeah. Um, I always use the analogy like Bernie Grumman mastering is known as like Bernie is a tinkerer. We build all the consoles that we master on in house. Oh, wow. So there's only seven of them in the world, five of them in L.A., two of them in Japan. We have a studio out there um, as well. But I always use the analogy that. Bernie Grunman mastering is like the formula one team that builds the car that you get in. They do all the testing. They put the right tires on it. They make sure everything's running right. I'm the guy that puts the helmet on and crashes into the wall or wins. (laughs) Right. So good analogy. I I can just be the dumb guy who puts it all out, (laughs) puts it all out there. So like, like the brain trust at the studio is really the technical people you should talk to, <laughs> but I'll do my best. Well, I'll say, you know, what, what's technical to me is probably, you'll be like, oh, bro, that's not technical. That's that's a basic ass question. But uh, some of these guys, like for instance, Steve's will probably come in here and ask some shit that'll go over 95% of our heads, but you guys will probably be able to conversate about it. Um, so, I mean, let's start with your room. Uh, I know, you know, the consoles, you know, built from scratch, but what about, uh, what about like, uh, speakers uh what 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 are you what what speakers do you uh, some what are your favorite reference monitors that you use um again back to the earlier point i've only ever mastered in the studio i'm in right now yeah and it's the same studio that all of those albums that we were discussing the drays the snoops like when brian retired it's not like he took the room with him the room stick so i'm still mastering through that same console um, the speakers in all of the studio are all Tannoy's. Um, okay. I think I think Bernie in the '80s had a sponsorship deal through them or something. But um, like we build the system, we build the crossovers, the amps, 
Um, so it, it really is custom. There's only a couple few pieces of gear in my rack that are like available for consumer purchase, but even yeah. those we, we tweak like signal path for a mastering engineer is everything right that and your room treatment so knowing your room and knowing your speakers is like i get i get asked that a lot like what would you do what would you first purchase be and i'm like fucking monitors that you trust Mm -hmm. you know what i mean and and sound treatment in a room so you know you're hearing what you're hearing um because i mean i get mixes a lot of the time and it's like I can kind of tell where that mix engineer's system is lacking. You know what I mean? Like, wow, you got, you got a whole lot of sub information here. Or you got too much bass guitar. Or, wow. This is really bright in the mids across the board. So maybe he's not hearing these things in his setup. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so I have Tannoy's kind of in the back wall of the studio in a, in a faucet or with a bass trap behind it. Um, and then on my console, I have a couple Tannoy near fields, just reference speakers. I don't really use them. They're more so for people in the room who aren't used to my bigger setup. Um, Cause in my studio, like there's a sweet spot, like I'm sure there is in every studio, right in the middle of my console where I sit you're getting the full range of things. If you move back in my room, it's bassy. You move up in my room, it's trebly. So, you know, it's it's gotta be weird for people to walk into a room they don't know, but I, I know that room and I know how it's gonna perform outside in my car. I know how it's gonna perform when it's streamed. Um, a lot of that is taking trust in your mastering guy and that he knows his shit. But yeah, um, yeah I mean, like, the the whole it's it, this is why it's hard to get technical because we build our power supplies the plugs for the power supplies our own wires we build we like everything it's crazy the amount of detail and testing that goes into whether or not we use the simplest piece of gear you know what i mean and i leave that to the guys who teach at sc and teach at UCLA who are also our techs. Okay. So they know like everything. Our, our younger tech, shit, I was asking him about a power supply thing and he went on a dissertation for a half an hour about how electricity works. And, and it was like, man, I'm just trying to get this song done so I can go home. But like, this, <laughs> you know, you're dropping knowledge on me. Um, but yeah, uh, the tannoys are, are pretty much what I was on. And then I have a, a really, really cheap ass radio shack pair of speakers that I keep on the floor um, that are just janky. But if shit sounds good through those, I know I'm golden. You know what I mean? Like as a mastering guy, my room sounds great. We, we could play anybody's mix without mastering it and it'll sound great. You know what I mean? Like the details all there. Um, and that again is, is attributed to the signal path. Like that's all that matters to mastering guys. It's like how much of your chain can you bypass? We don't want electronics in here. We don't want, you know, we don't want to run this through your DSer because that's just another signal that has to get run through another piece of gear. So everything's bypassable in my room. Um, And yeah, I mean, that was drilled into my head very early on. And I, even though I'm not the technical guy understanding all the reasoning behind it, I hear it in the end product. Like they change a module and I can hear that. They change the power supply and I can hear that. And, And they're really, they're tiny, right? But you add up all those little tiny things that clean up the signal and add them together, you get a really clean signal, right? And that's really a mastering guy is not like, I don't want people to hear me and know me, right? Like it's, it's a, it's a weird gig to have because you don't have the notoriety of like a mix guy, but 
you're also not necessarily going for the notoriety of a mix guy. I want to, I want to bring out details. So you go, wow, that that's a great song. Like, I don't care who made it, you know, engineers care, like, but we're all fucking weird anyway to be engineers in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> Cause we're weirdos. Anyway, sorry. No, I, I can't, you got me <laughs> early and caught. Get that caffeine in you. Know. Is, is all, is you, I know you said, uh, you know, about how signal processes everything. You don't really want too many electronics in the room. Is your entire process done on outboard gear? Is there anything that you use like software VSTs for um, any of the time? So the console is an analog console, right? And, and it always was that. I don't use plugins, to be honest. I mean, I do. I'm lying. I use a uh, fab filter. Okay. Um, usually just to make up gain. I've never EQ'd a song using software or a plugin. I do all the EQs on the console. So there's times where I have to kind of do a hybrid thing where I got as much gain as I can get out of the board before it's, you know, really clipping heavily or distorting. And I need a couple more dB. I'll make that up in the box. Okay. But after I've run it through all my chain. Um, and that's really just to give it a little bit more level. Um, but like my D to A converter, my A to D converter, those, um, uh, they're, they're still modded. My, uh, my D to A is a, is a 924 Lavery Gold. And that like we go in and take any electronics that aren't necessary for playback. We're only concerned about playback, right? up until I'm recording into a different workstation. Okay. Um, so that's been modded. I have uh, DB Technologies MK2 as my A to D, that's been modded. Um, even our Antelope uh, Trinity clock, like there's a, this is again, me not being the technical guy, like there's a component, a, a chemical component that locks that to the atomic clock and we've changed out whatever that chemical is to the point where like the government sent us an email, like, what are you doing over there? Why do you need whatever? Like, are yeah. you building bombs or some shit, yeah. <laughs> you know? And sure. we're like, no, we're just trying to get our clocking like as precise as possible. And, and again, that's got nothing to do with me. That's all the brain trust in that studio. Yeah. And the two techs, like the older tech is from the analog era. So if I have any tape machine problems or patch bay issues or analog problems, he's my guy. The other tech, who's also a mastering guy, he was like a nuclear submarine engineer. So he gets all this digital shit and builds equipment based on his needs. And to me, that's insane. Like I'm going to spend half a day building a box to do blank and then the next day he's got that in his you know on his board kind of frankenstein to do some shit. So, so it's it's wild to work with people like that i don't pretend at all to understand what they're doing <laughs> but yeah. if, if they keep my room working right i'm good oh yeah what are your thoughts on like things like Lander, like, you know, the auto mastering upload and it spits out a master, uh, kind of like AI mastering, or if you have any experience yeah. with that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a fan. Big surprise. Um, yeah. I'll address that two ways. One, um, I've done shootouts against Lander, right? People who don't want to, invest in their mastering and I get it. Like some people can't justify the cost of mastering. Everybody I know who's ever mastered though has never not mastered after they've mastered. They can tell the difference. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a hard sell for people who are, you know, struggling to even get to that point. So I get it. Um, I'm better than Lander in my opinion. I'm better than any of those. And I think that even mastering guys that have their own plugin, would say that they themselves mastering a song is going to be better than the software that they build. Right. right. And that, again, that's back to my point about a relationship between you and somebody else, like two humans discussing the need in that song. Mm. Who do you call it Lander? 
nobody. You upload it again and see if they send you back the same algorithm. All that being said, at the same time, I'm a fan of music and I like I'm a champion. I always root for the underdog. Right. So like if you're a kid who made a song and you're like, well, I, I can't afford I've spent all my lawn mowing money on this song and I can't pay for mastering, but I can afford Lander. Dope. Upload it to Lander and have it mastered. I'm not hating on that. Like if that if that progresses your career or gets you the gig or whatever it is, you know, like pleases you, then it's mastered. Like I, right. I, I can't really hate on those things. It provides a service to people who can't afford a different quality of service. I, I can't drive a Ferrari. So I drive the lander of Ferrari. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right. I get it. I, I can't hate on it. I, I just don't understand it um, from a give and take back and forth. Here's what I want out of my project. Um, and I hope this doesn't piss off any of your listeners. I feel the same way about like I mix and I master. Like that's to me, that's like a new thing that people are doing and, and I'm not going to shit on it. I just know that I've got more experience doing that and that's all I do. So I feel like I'm going to be better at that than you are. Mm -hmm. You're mixing hopefully to the best of your abilities as a mix engineer. What happens between your mix and your master? Like, do you change the way you hear things? You're when you hire a mastering engineer, you're paying for a different set of ears. You're paying right. for a different perspective and you're paying for the expertise that that person brings. Um, so I, I know mixers who also master and their shit sounds good, but, but to me, I would much rather be great at one thing than say I can do 10 things so I can take all the money. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, I mix it and mastered it. Well, I'm going to double my rate or whatever, whatever that is. It's just, um, but then again, now I start sounding like the old guy who's telling you to get off his lawn because <laughs> I came up in this analog era where I couldn't, you know, juggle five different aspects of, you know, putting out music, but I'm, I'm cool with that. Yeah. I think, it, I think a lot of it is just, you know, like the coming up in the era of like, you know, bed, working out of your bedroom, having everything you need and, you know, uh, you know, going to the student, it's like, hey, I know how to throw some plugins on the master channel, make it sound loud and make it sound better than it would without me doing that kind of thing. Uh, but I know I definitely because I, I believe like if I track it, I don't want to mix it. And if I mix it, obviously, I don't want to I want to send it to someone else to to make it sound even better, polish it. Right. Up. Right. And, and that's kind of the way it had always been. So I think it's weird for me being like, I always kind of explain it. I'm sure to you guys, I'm an older generation, but to me, I'm, I'm in between. I'm still working with guys who were around in the sixties and seventies and eighties mastering things. Yeah. And I'm working with kids who are like 20 years old. So I'm in that middle ground where I'm straddling, you know, my knowledge of analog, what's trying to stay up with what's current now. Um, I don't really listen to other mastering engineers work. Mastering is a hard thing to analyze anyway, because you don't know what the mix was. So you, how can you really judge the mastering without kind of a being those two things against each other? Right, right, right. Um, but you certainly know a bad master when you hear it. <laughs> <laughs> makes sense. Makes sense. Um, anyway. Let's talk about that question I first brought up, man, about the soft clipper. And uh, why, do, why does that just seem to be like a, makes you know just makes all the difference you know when when us guys are making beats um i think it's just a sound that people like now like i have kids right and one's 22 one's 18 okay and okay. they've they've not grown up listening to music like i grew up right like they're listening to streaming almost exclusively like my son's in the vinyl thank god um, my daughters tried to get into vinyl. I tried to explain the difference of audio quality of things, but it's a different world. Like nobody's buying 
physical copies, right? Nobody's buying CDs. They might be buying vinyl, which is great. We're, we're busy as hell at the studio cutting vinyl. But um, I think that a new generation's ears are more in tune with sounds they like. So you can pick any popular artist that people emulate. And if that mix had certain elements to it, you can watch the industry gravitate towards that thing or use those sounds. So, I mean, I think it's pleasing to people because you've heard people have success with that. So you're going to kind of go to that well, and you're not wrong for doing that. Um, I clip shit at the studio all the time. I have to clip to get things out loud. Right. Um, so there's a sacrifice to play in that world of the loudness wars, which we're guilty of. And Brian actually was really guilty of. He was one of the first to push levels to crazy. But I hear mastering now where it blows my mind how loud things are. Like, how can you get that shit that loud? And do you hear that distortion? Because I hear that distortion, but maybe it doesn't matter. And, yeah. and again... I feel like the old man on the mountain yelling at younger kids. But I also realize like noise and distortion has become part of music now. Right. right? right. Whereas, whereas before when I started, it was all about purity and clarity and not like, don't distort anything. Well, go listen to Igor from Tyler, the creator. Like there's distortions and noises and like, or some lo-fi even genre hip hop stuff that's just blown out. Like it's a sound now. Yeah, it's supposed that, to sound that way. Right. But as a mastering guy, you're like, shit, how can I reduce this? Right. Mm -hmm. Like I did a Brockhampton album a couple years ago. And like half of the songs on that were just kind of blown out. And as a mastering guy, you're you're trying to figure out how to handle that. How can I soften this so it's more pleasurable experience? And then you get three more songs in and then you're like, okay, this is a theme now. Maybe I need to get the hell out of the way of all this and let that happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, as far as clipping goes, if it sounds good, like I think the rules that pertain to analog there's, there's, and this is part of the fun part of being an engineer. If you like tinkering is that there aren't any rules. You can make up whatever freaking rule you want. Yeah. That thing distorting through the whole track. I like that. Okay. Well, cool. Then we'll do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I get mixes that are, you know, tiny, skinny little worms in pro tools. I get bricks in pro tools. Uh, I get, I get kind of the the wide array of, of of everything as far as mixes go. I think people that um, send me bricks that have their own limiting on them, like there's very few people that submit mixes for mastering that are loud, that don't distort or aren't compromised or aren't something that I can necessarily add to maybe level wise. So then I got to find something else maybe that, the track needs or maybe a track doesn't need anything like that's that's part of being a mastering engineer too is like when don't you need to do anything mm. like sometimes I, I've, I've gotten mixes from the post malone people from the tyler people that don't need anything like cool we're just going to take that one and run it through my chain with nothing and just capture it over here cool great sounds sounds great okay so i mean that's a, a cop out maybe, <laughs> but, um, man, if it's, if, if whatever effects you're putting on your mix or what you want out of the mix, great. I don't compress a lot. I don't limit a lot. I have a board limiter, but it's, you know, it's a universal limiter. I'm not just, you know, I'm not just limiting a, a section of your track. Um, it's kind of across the board unless I'm editing in sections, but I meant as far as like, compressing just the drums or compressing, you know, certain aspects of the mix. Um, because I, I feel like there's way more compression happening in inside of mixes that maybe 
back in the tape days needed a little bit more glue than they do now. Um, so if you're a mixer and you have compression or a limiter that you like, but you, you have to know that it's not distorting, right? And you have to know that it's not crapping out or that it's going to affect too many other things inside the mix. Um, handcuffing me, right? But I tell people all the time, hey, send me one with some limiting that you like and then send me one with no limiter and then send me the one that you've been playing for everybody, like you said, the one where you just throw a, an L2 on it and right. everybody gets hype because it's 10 dB louder than everything you've ever heard before. But that's not going to work in the real world. Like, that's great in your studio. My job is to make sure that that thing's going to sound great, whether you're listening in my studio, your studio, a Honda Civic, a boombox, or transistor radio. Like we're, we're trying to average the best sound for all of those things. 100% man. Anyway. So how long, how long can you work on a song before you, uh, like experience ear fatigue and, and how do you, how do you deal with that? Uh, I get up and I walk out. Um, I mean, ear fatigue is a real thing. I, I try to not master more than like an album and maybe a couple singles a day. Okay. Um, but so you, say that, you say that like, it's not a lot. <laughs> no, I know it's a lot, but it's, it's weird. It's, it's not a lot in comparison to, mastering engineers for a mix guy you'd be like shit i spent six months working on an album right 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 I spent four hours you know what i mean like that's that that doesn't mean i'm great it's just it it's not as labor intensive um mm -hmm. you know like mixing is is a very micro thing right so you're laboring over the level of each individual piece or mastering is a macro thing i'm looking at the whole picture you've done your if you've done your job right then my job's probably going to be pretty easy i'm just going to be like well maybe maybe we could hear a little bit more of this vocal if i add a little bit in this frequency or mm -hmm. this snare drum could use a little bit more power or this kick could use a little more snap and and it's it's smaller details like that it's not like i need to create a baseline because there's not enough bass in this mix if there's not enough of something in a mix, I, you know, it, there's a trade-off. If I try and add a shit ton of low end, that affects everything in the sound spectrum, not just the bass. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that answered your question. Not for sure. Yeah. So about four hours worth of work before you're like, hey, you're done for the day or you got to take like an hour break or. No, like, well, it, I mean, it, it depends. Um, sometimes I'll start an album and then like walk away from it three songs in take 20 minutes and then go back and see if I feel like I'm on the right path right okay. I mean I've mastered an entire album taking it down to the parking garage and listened into my car for a minute and then walked right back upstairs and threw that sheet away and started all over again like um it, it just, it depends a lot on how prepared the mix is. So from a cost effective standpoint for a mixer or an artist to come to mastering, if that mix is as prepared as it can be, you're going to save money, right? Rather than, I think this is right. Let's send it to the mastering guy and see what happens. Um, and that happens a lot. Like I go back and forth with people who want to hear what I'm going to do then they go back and readdress the mix based on my mastering, call me and say, hey, use the same settings you ran the last time. I went and turned up this or changed to, you know, added a little bit more of this, but I like what your mastering was doing everywhere else. Um, so there's no like recipe for perfection, but like, again, that takes a relationship between people where I'm not going to get offended by him saying, I'm going to change my mix based on your mastering. And he hopefully won't get offended if I say I can't do that in mastering. That's more of a mix issue, mm. right? Like we used to fake vocal ups for people just by adding some mid range in the vocal. And 
it's a perception thing. It's not really a vocal up. It's just brighter in the mids. But if you've never heard that song before, you don't know that. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, <clears throat> like today, I think I've got five singles and an album revision to do when I get to the studio. But like singles don't really take that long to master because you're not comparing it to other things, right? If, if I'm just doing one song for somebody, <clears throat> it's freeing as hell because I can make that as loud as I want. I can shape the sound any way I, I feel is fit and then send it out to them. If I'm mastering an album, I can't do that. I have to make sure that these songs sonically, even though the elements are different between songs, that there's as much cohesion as there can be, right? Yeah. Whether that, I mean, not just volume levels, but like, is the vocal brighter in this song than it is in that song? I want the vocals to kind of be in a similar area. I, you know, some songs have, 808s that just resonate forever and then some songs just have like a boom bat beat with like no, no sub information at all and like how do you make those songs that might be right next to each other in a sequence work right mm -hmm. sometimes you're you're toning certain things down and pushing other frequencies on other songs to try and find like that median that satisfactory for everything here you know so yeah singles singles aren't as fatiguing as when you're trying to really analyze things and, and dig in deep and then like i i critique the shit out of myself man i think that that's also part of what really makes a good engineer and every good engineer i know is that same kind of guy like i'll nitpick me harder than you can so you know and i tell that to people all the time like after i master your song we send you a reference to evaluate me. I want to hear your worst because there's nothing you can tell me that I don't already know, or I'm not like, I don't have an ego about it. This is your project. It's not my work. I want to give you what you want. If, if my ear told me to push your mids and give you some vocal clarity, but that killed the vibe that you were going for. You're right. Like mm. the, it's, at the end of the day, everything that I'm doing is service based. So you are coming to me for my opinion and you don't, you don't have to take it. Right. And sometimes I'm wrong. And sometimes I do better than what the client thought they were going to get out of it. It's, you know, it's kind of a crapshoot, but again, that relationship and that back and forth, like I just want everybody who hires me, whether you're, you know, saving up babysitting money to put out your song or your Kendrick Lamar. Like you get the same amount of energy, the same gear, the same everything. Like who who's to say who the next big thing is? So every session that you have, you got to treat those people the same way you would somebody who's already an established guy. Sure, man. Hey, man. Gems on gems, man. Let's uh let's bring in uh let's bring in some guys for Q and A, man. I know they uh I know they got some good questions. Let's bring Steez in, man. We might as well bring them in. The legendary Steez. <laughs> <laughs> yo, yo, hold up, hold up. Um, yo, good morning. Hey, good morning, bro. Man, long time no talk. How you doing, Dylan? Been good, man. Where you been, bro? Dude, I've been uh I've actually been mixing this album. Oddly enough been uh kind of losing sleep and i've been missing the morning show i, I ain't even gonna cap yeah man you got you got tap out i'm glad you tap back in today i knew you would tap back in today matter of fact dude i rolled out of bed and saw the notification was like holy shit and like fucking yeah so, <laughs> let's God. master that album man yeah i know for real um how you doing mike <laughs> i'm good man how are you i'm good i'm uh slowly waking up got my coffee but uh, I actually wrote down a couple questions. You answered a few, but um, <clears throat> I don't even really know how to begin it. Um, <clears throat> you've had like a pretty, pretty like all over the place, you know, with the genres that you've worked on um, mm -hmm. and like decades and stuff too. Um, like even for instance, like the difference between like Flower Boy and Igor, 
um, I guess like, what type of things are you typically noticing when like you get those mixes handed to you? Um, obviously like each situation is different, but like you had mentioned like you'll get a skinny wave file, you get the brick, but like, are you going more for like consonants and like syllabants and like shit like that? Or are you like, I'm just trying to get an understanding because those two albums are like very different. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. No, they are different. Um, first of all, Neil Pogue makes those. And yeah. and Neil, Neil is an amazing mixer. If you don't know Neil's work, you should Google Neil's work. Neil's one of my favorite just human beings in this industry. Um, Neil mixed Outcast. Neil worked with PLC. Um, and Neil did Flower Boy and Igor. Mm. And um, Neil's mixes are incredible, like from the jump, right? He's got such good taste and, and his volumes of his mixes, like he and I have a recipe, as I was saying earlier to Dylan, like you work with a certain mix guy repeatedly, you kind of know each other's tendencies. And Neil calls what I do his turtle wax. He's like, I just need the turtle wax. And I know what that means. Yeah. That means he wants me to put a little air up top. If there's something in the mids that I can clarify, like maybe try and throw something in there. Um, other than that, like his stuff doesn't need a whole lot of treatment. Mm. And his mixes are pretty loud. I always try and get them a little bit louder because it always makes him go, I don't know how you made that louder, but you did. And that's dope. Yeah. Um, but his stuff's really together on flower boy. It's, it's interesting because Brian who I'd worked for had, had done everything up to flower boy for Tyler. Right. Amazing. And I remember the first time meeting Tyler and hearing Tyler, like I didn't get it as a hip hop fan. I didn't get it. I, yeah. I grew up, you know, I grew up in the, Run DMC, Beastie Boys, Public Enemy, yeah. Dave, and like there's like that that just used to be hip hop and rap, and now there's like a million subgenres of rap. And at the time, Tyler was I don't even know what you'd call that horror rap or like yeah, yeah. I was <laughs> I was an Odd Future kid in high school, and it it was hard to like a lot of people on the outside were like, who is this guy? You know, right? Like like, like I heard it and was just like. I don't know if this is garbage or if this is dope. Like I really didn't know. And then I met him and the first time I met him, I swore he was on drugs because he's just <laughs> like an animated dude, but he's a genius. Tyler is a genius. There is no doubt about that to me. Um, anyway, but on those early albums, you could tell like the ideas were there. I think him linking up with Neil as a mixer was genius because that elevated everything for Tyler. Um, not just musically, but like his brand soared after that. Exactly. Um, and I think if you listen to like Outcast to me still sounds current. Those albums are yeah. 20 years old, you know what I mean? But you listen to them and you're like, shit, they were so far ahead of their time. Yeah. And they worked with Neil. So now you have Tyler, who I feel like is way ahead of his time. Yep. working with Neil yep. and probably for the same reasons. I think on Flower Boy, when they came in the master, it was me and Neil and Tyler and his management. And Tyler, I think at the time was probably leaving it up to Neil and I really to figure it out. I, I don't expect artists to really know what mastering is all about. Yeah. Um, I like to try and explain it, but in general, I think they kind of defer to the mix guy a lot of times. Yeah. unless they know what they're doing. And Tyler obviously knows what he's hearing because he does a lot of his own production. Yeah. Um, he didn't have a ton of notes. And I think just as fans, Neil and I were like, you know, kind of going for the vibe that that album brought. Right. And then when they brought Igor through, I remember Neil telling me before they even came in for the session, like, I'm like, so what is this like Flower Boy 2.0? He's like, man, that's all he said was like, man. <laughs> and and to me, that's exciting. Like, cool, let, let's see what we bring in. And Tyler came in for that session and he 
first of all, he's hilarious. Like that dude's just straight up hilarious. He knew what he wanted. His way of describing what he wanted was unique. Like he, as you know, engineers have engineer speak. A lot of it's really nerdy. (laughs) A lot of it is universal. A lot of it is like mix guy talk, mastering guy talk, producer talk. Tyler talks cinematically. So we would pull up a song and he would, he would be outside my room until he heard us start playing a song. Right. And Neil and I'd be sitting at the console and Tyler would come in and say, all right, bet. I want this song to sound like, and then describe an event. Like, you know, make this song feel like somebody kicked you in the balls. Like, (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, how do you transfer that? What does that mean in audio terms, right? So he'd come in, make that comment, walk out. I'd look at Neil. Neil would look at me. We'd both go, and and we'd master it. Um, But, like, you know all the content on those albums for Tyler are what he wants to be there. So really – not to say I disregarded what he said because what he said did make sense when we got back to it. He's like darker, you know what I mean? Like those, those concepts I understand a little bit more. Um, but I think he kind of like let us do our thing and then, you know, would come in and be like, fuck yeah. Or this like uh new magic wand on that album, which is my yeah. favorite, my favorite track. Like he's like, when this section happens, I want my crowd, like he's talking like a live show. This is where everybody loses their fucking mind. Mm. So make that happen. <laughs> You're like, hey, it sounded good at Camp Flognaw, man. I was there last, like the one that just happened. And yeah, yeah. yeah it, it sounded amazing, man. But you know, you're you're just kind of like throwing your hands up, like, I I hope this is what he wants. But on both of those albums, it's crazy. He had no revisions on either of them. So wow. I, I, but I think that speaks to confidence, right? Like he's confident in his shit and, and he should be, but like, excuse me for being so brash so early in the morning, but like, fuck, like if you don't get this, fuck you. It's okay. And, and, and to be honest with you, when I was mastering that album, I didn't really get it. I'm like, where's the lyrics? Like it sounded like a bunch of hooks, dope beats, but just like, is this just an ad lib album or like, what is this? Yeah. And, and for me, that's always been a problem. Like I can't analyze what an album means when I'm working on it. Like favorite project that I've ever worked on was to pimp a butterfly, but I couldn't digest that album for a year. You know what I mean? Like when you're working on it, you're just doing these individual acts trying to make this whole thing work and then you listen to the whole thing outside of the context of your profession and you holy shit like wow that's fucking wild and igor was that for me as soon as i got that in the car and like listened to it myself i was like wow and and my son's a big tyler fan he's like this album's dope and i'm like you're 18 years old. You know better than me. So, you know. You guys killed it, man. The distortion, like the way that it's dark and bright at the same time, it has, right. I don't know, it's, it's really well, but, cool. But that's my point to Dylan. Like, those things would have been like, why are you adding distortion yeah. 25 years ago, 30 years ago? People didn't understand that at all. You That was the last thing you wanted. So now to be working with artists like that, yeah, like okay you know and like a a similar guy not to just keep it all about odd future but like earl sweatshirt stuff is similar where i listen to that and i'm like this is so lo-fi maybe i just keep it really lo-fi you know because that's what his vibe is so you've got to kind of know what the artist wants again that's asking the artist what do you want you know like where are we going with this gotcha um, yeah, I'm, I'm mixing this album right now that kind of falls in a lot of similarities with Igor and like, kind of like newer Beck, you know what I mean? Where it's just like alternative, but then 808s, but then distortion. Yeah. Um, I, my next question for you, and it kind of falls with that is like, 
throughout the years you've seen the trend of loudness go to like maybe we're looking at the peak of it now because of loudness normalization with Spotify and stuff like that. That right. wasn't even a thing. There was no such thing as LUFS metering when you were mixing. You know what I mean? So where yeah. where do you kind of stand on that conversation? Because I know like a lot of kids can get Ozone 9 and put a maximizer on stuff and just look at a meter and hope it hits right. You know what I mean? Like where, yeah. where do you- Ozone think? drives me nuts, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> only Only because- there are aspects of ozone that are incredible. I think the bottom end with ozone is like, you can get crazy with the yeah. bottom end. The low end focus module is crazy. Yes. But the top end to me is garbage. <laughs> right. So, yeah. um, but I'll, I'll have people who will give me a pre-mastered mix that they ran through ozone. And now I'm trying to compete with low end. That's almost not realistic. Right. Getting back to the conversation about how is that going to perform on different systems? Like that sounds dope if you've got subs, yeah. but if you got a shitty system, it's just going to be paper flapping in, inside your car doors. You know what I mean? Um, and you can't really cut that on vinyl, you know? No, like, well, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother thing. Yeah, like, that's, that's my other question. Cause I know you're cutting. All right, we'll, we'll approach that. I'll stay with your lust reading real quick. Um, so back in the day when you were doing CDs, the only parameter we had was distortion. Like I could, I can turn up a CD all day long yeah. until it distorts. Um, but yeah, the loudness wars have been getting crazy. Like if you go back and listen to stuff we mastered in 93, 94, right? Go listen to Snoop's first album. Go listen to The Chronic. Compare it to the levels we're at now we're way louder and we were loud back then. And that was the and, standard. Right. And Brian, who I worked for yep. and his contemporary on the West, uh, East coast, whose name is escaping me at the moment. Um, they would kind of like, you know, it was like this friendly competition of volumes. Right. And it works for hip hop, but that doesn't work for metal. Like I can't, oh, no. I can't crank up a metal song because your ears are gonna bleed because there's so much mid range and guitar stuff, right? But hip hop lends itself to that a lot, and a lot of genres are stealing from hip hop. Like listen to country songs. When did an 808 enter the country yeah. music realm? Literally. You know what I mean? Literally. So like, and and I'm a huge fan of all music, but I'm a big fan of rock and hip hop. And they're copying all that because hip hop is fucking dope, right? Yeah, and it's winning. And, and there's more of a blend between genres. Like when I was coming up in high school, I had a mullet. Leave me alone. <laughs> I liked, you know, I liked heavy metal and I liked hip hop. And... And that was like this back then. Like people didn't understand that. Like pick a lane. Yeah. Now it's like skater kids, yeah. black skater kids, purple skater kids, blue skater kids love every type of music. You know what I mean? And to me, that's fucking amazing because my generation was kind of put in a lane you liked rock or you liked pop or you liked R and B or you liked rap or top 40 or whatever it was. And now I just think like the genres blend, you see, you know, crossover artists on each other's songs. Like, I think it's great because it opens up audiences from either, you know, genre to something different. Um, I'm getting way off topic. Your question was about no, I love ozone. it though. I no, was but, a metal kid, so I love it. So what was? I mean, the question was about ozone. Yeah, it's pretty much just about Luff's metering. You know that okay. final that final submission right. before you hit upload to fucking Distro Kid and all those guys. Right. You know, because all right, that I'll, I'll, on the normalization is not the same when you upload it. You know, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I don't read my Luff's readings. I don't analyze my mastering like that. I just don't. I, I, I can, and I have to give somebody information. I just, I mean, I, it goes back to knowing your room. I know what loud is in my room, right? Based on years of doing things and those things being successful, I'm not going to break that 
you know, recipe. I'm going to keep putting things in this area of loudness, but I'm not always trying to be as loud as humanly possible because sometimes that doesn't lend itself to the style of music. And I'll give you an example. Um, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. A, a hip hop artist wants their shit really loud, right? I'll compare it to a Travis Scott song, a Kanye song, a whatever song. I want to be that. And if you give me that song, it like, first of all, it can't ever be that, which I think is part of a misconception. Like people will come to you for what you're known for. But I've had so many people come to me and say, hey, I want that post Malone low end on on this song. And I'm like, cool. Did you put it in your song? Like, mm. I, you know, did you hire Manny Mariquin to mix this for you? Did you you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of elements that you can't just say, hey, that worked on that guy's album. Do it for mine. Like, I'm only as good as the mix, really. Right. Um, Luff's readings, I think I come in somewhere between seven and nine, okay. right? Minus seven and minus nine, generally. Yeah. I've had people ask me for things that are minus 14 for Spotify. And here's the problem. Spotify and Apple Music and any of those streaming platforms, they're not all uniform. So... I need to make one master because nobody wants me to master for Spotify, then master for iTunes, then master for this, you know, whatever else title. Um, so I'm making one master to service everything, right? Back in the day, like my mentor made shit ton of money because every country needed its own master. Every region in the country sometimes needed its own master. Walmart needed its own master. Target needed its own master. Wow. Now, one digital master is everything for everywhere, right? And the Spotify thing is interesting because you're getting, I, I'm sure of it, people are still submitting super loud mixes and Spotify is just turning them down. That's not increasing any dynamic range or, or anything like that. It's just leveling out the volume levels. So if you're listening in a playlist, you're not, you know, up and down volume writing while you're listening. Um, and nobody, like I said, nobody wants to pay twice. And to be honest, if I master something at a CD level, say, and I'm in the minus eight luffs area, we'll just pick that. If I were to run it again, trying to get around minus 14, that signal is going to hit every piece of my chain differently, yeah. right? It's going to hit my converters differently. It's going to hit my compressor differently. It's going to sound different. So it really would be two separate masterings. They might not be that different from each other, but they're different from each other. Yeah. And, you know, uniformity and attention to detail, as any engineer knows, is like everything. So you can't have two different sounding masters out in the world. Yeah. Um, and people, once I kind of explain to them, we can do it this way or that way, or we can do both, but it's going to cost you twice as much. They always, always go for the loud one. And that's okay. Cause it, it still works. Like I still hear some loud streams and go, wow. You know, like I like listening on headphones at home and I like feeling like I'm in the mix and I like width and depth and some of those things that are really, really loud or compromising that, right? They get a little flatter, a little more 2D because you're just going for volume and you're killing some of that dynamic range. So I, I'm just trying to hit like this area where I can compete with the really loud shit, but I also have the taste and the delicacies of a quieter mix, right? Because I want it to sound good. Like I want it to sound musical and a lot of people, certainly people who don't know engineering or care about engineering, if you play them the same song, 3 dB different in volume, but the quieter one has more definition, more detail, more dynamics, they're still gonna pick the loud one because it's loud. And people will say that one's better. Why? It's louder. I, I felt it more. 
but you know what I mean? All right. <laughs> like right. it's, it's a hard, as a mastering guy, it's a hard battle to fight and it's, a, it's becoming I'm, more and more so like you're fucking pissing in the wind because yeah. you know, it's hard, it's hard to please everybody and give them everything all at once. And, and I'm not, we're not the kind of studio that's going to like, load your project at 192 and dither it down for every sample rate and then you know charge you five times like if you want something at 4424 and 4824 i'm running it twice if you want it at 96 i'm running it a third time i'm running it the same way each time but that's that's mastering not saying let's take this thing and just you know dither it for every possible medium we're ever going to need and just call it a day and charge that guy for each part that I didn't really have to make. And I was going to say to the point of, you know, like, you know, you, you, you do this, this is your craft, this is your art, you know what I mean? So it's like, you really, you're going to appreciate that dynamic range and stuff like that. But the consumer is just like, you know, I just want it loud, you know what I mean? So it's like, a, a, it's probably a hard balance for you. Well, I, I mean, I, I feel like, any engineer, no matter what you do, if you're a producer, if you're a mixer, if you're a mastering guy, like your, your ears and your tendencies are built off your experience listening to music, right? Yeah, so yeah. If, if you only listen to hip hop, I can't expect you to understand maybe how to approach a country song or a jazz track or a rock song. Um, I've always had a really broad taste in music. And I think that that has certainly helped me address issues. Like I can be working on a hip hop track, but use heavy metal tendencies to fix a hip hop issue. You know what I mean? And I think that just comes over time. Like people are in such a hurry to be great quick and, and nobody really wants to, look at the realization that you could be doing this for a long time before you even get, you know, a flash of light in your direction. You got to kind of love it, fall in love with it. Like this is a weird, I'm tangenting off again. This is a weird industry to be in um, because it takes dedication. Go ask my ex-wife. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like um, it's hard. And and you make sacrifices that are beyond, you know, like people hear you say, oh, you make sacrifices. Look at your client list. Like what big sacrifices are you making? You weren't there for the 20 years before that. You weren't there at 2 a.m. when I was by myself struggling to get through a project that had to be done in the morning and wondering if this is for me. Like, do I really want to do this? Well, at the time I had you know, a, a young kid and a mortgage. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm doing whatever I got to do to keep this job, whether I hate it right now, that guy's getting all the shine. I'm doing all the work, you know, like all that ego driven shit. Um, I think I put that to bed pretty quickly as soon as I realized like, all right, cool. I got a career now. I turned a job into a career and you can only do that by showing up every day and working your ass off. It doesn't matter what you do. Right. And some people look at engineering or music in general as a job. And it is my lifeline. Like I have to do this. I can't do anything else now other than dig ditches and shit. So, I mean, and that's nothing against people that dig ditches. I just don't want to do that. You know what I mean? So, um, we're all a little weird to be in this fucking business for sure. And I think we're all a little damaged up here, but it works <laughs> mostly. Man. Crazy. Um, yeah, I honestly, man, I want to hop off here. Cause I know that there's probably a couple other guys in here, but I, my last question, I'm sure, you know, you can answer it is like when you're receiving these mixes, obviously, you know, you had mentioned Neil, like, that's that's like a perfect marriage like that's like the final baton pass like right. you you know what i mean when you're working with someone you know that's submitting a mix and let's say it's a little bit too quiet or on the other scale it's uh it's too brick walled like what 
I guess my question is, what is your preference in that situation? Are you, are you like down to smash the limiter a little bit more or when you're receiving those things, like you're like, Oh fuck, it's a brick wall time to start like subtracting and start, you know, what, um, what is more ideal for you. I mean, in general, before somebody submits something, like if you're asking like what I'd prefer submitted to me, yeah, I want some headroom. I want like three to six dB would be optimal. Like I don't want to have to turn you up too much because then you're going to start hearing my gear. And I don't want you to be too loud because if you're distorting or you've got too much of something, I really can't add to that. Right. And then, yeah, maybe I'm subtracting or even turning you down, which I hate doing because again, that goes back to the loudness thing. People perceive that as wrong. Like, and I'll say, well, yeah, you gave me a mix that was too loud. So I'm turning you down and then have to explain that what I just said, like this has to be able to play everywhere, not just in your dope studio. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I, I will master whatever you give me and, and it's, it's a bit of a cop out. I'll have the conversation. If, if, the, if a track comes over and it's just ass and, and that has nothing to do with the mix, like it's just maybe you had something in the chain you forgot to take off and it's distorted. I'm going to call you and say, dude, send me another, you know, bounce this again. Just give me a little bit more headroom. But for the most part, I, I don't come across many mixes that I can't figure out a way to get them back something to hear. And then that puts it back in your court. Right. So if you gave me something where I'm adding 16 dB of gain because it's so quiet, like, and then you come back to me and say, well, I'm, I'm hearing like, just like some low hissy something or, or whatever it is. I'm like, well, okay, maybe bounce it again a little bit louder. Like you got, you have plenty of room to turn that up for me and then you'll hear less of me. Um, but yeah, I master whatever you bring in. I, I don't care about the quality. I'm still going to do the best I can for the mix. Yeah. And then, you know, the cop out, if you call it a cop out, I just call it, you know, a collaboration. I'm going to send it back to you to see what you want to do with it. A lot of people will go back and adjust their mix and that's cool. Do you hear shit and mastering that you didn't hear in the mix? you know, or in your room because I brought out a little detail and now you're thinking your egg shaker's a little bit too loud. Well, cool. Turn it down. I'm going to run it the same way. We'll get it right. Or I can try and dip your egg shaker frequency range. Um, the thing that a lot of people don't understand is when you fix it in mastering, which has been, <laughs> you know, that fucking phrase forever, like you can only fix so much shit in mastering. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? So um, again, I, I think it's good to be able to go back and forth. I never charge for that first revision. Like if I send you something and you listen to it and you're like, uh, it sounds, you know, a little too crispy here. Or maybe if you could smooth out the vocal there, that first revision is, is on the house because I'm guessing what you want. Yeah. If you're in the room, then we can both listen and we can both talk about what we're hearing and I can explain to you what I'm doing. I'm, I'm also one of those guys. I think mastering dudes back in the day, I mean, I know they do because I work with them. Keep shit close to the vest. Like, here's my secrets and I ain't telling nobody. <laughs> like, I, but now, like, this channel... Pensado's plays any of those streaming channels like there's a shit ton of information for people to go and get yeah. I'm not saying that makes you an engineer if you watch all those things you still have to put it all into practice right but like there's so many more avenues to learn shit from people and there's a sharing of information that like you'd have to go intern somewhere you'd have to go be an assistant at a real studio to learn that stuff. And now you have it all kind of at, at your fingertips. And that's, you know, to me, that's pretty dope. Um, I, I like sharing my information. I don't keep things all close to the best. If you come in my room and we have a session, I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm doing for two reasons. One, I want you to get better because if you get better and you come back to me, and I sound better, well, then we both won. We both got better. 
And the second part of that, and that goes back to the custom gear, I don't care how good of a mastering engineer you are, you're not going to copy my sound because you don't have my gear. It's all custom gear, just like I can't copy some dude in New York's mastering because he's got his gear, right? So you go to a guy for something you like or the tendencies of his sound or, or whatever the reason people come to me. I think a lot of it is who I've worked with and that's great, man. That's the calling card now. It's not a business card. It's a, what's the, show me the records you worked on. Well, there you go. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think, I think sharing the information is huge and I think it makes people better. I just think sometimes people are just jumping off the highest diving board they can from the get go. And there's a, there's a really big learning curve in anything if you want to be great at it. And like, I had this conversation with, with David Kim the other day, he was texting me about like, he was bummed about some shit. And I'm like, bro, like we do this every day, yeah. you know, and we're getting better. And so what you heard some guys mix that you were impressed by and you wish you could mix like that. Yeah. Bernie Grumman mastered fucking thriller and every Prince album there ever was. So like, yeah, I want to do that too. Like we all have somebody we want to copy. The great thing about engineering is it's a never ending learning curve. And once you understand that it's a lot less stressful. You, you stop chasing, knowing everything realize that you're going to have to continue to learn as you go, but like focus on the thing at hand, the task at hand, those you'll get, you'll get better at those things as you do. Right. I'm a much better master engineer now than I was five years ago and a thousand percent better than I was 10 years ago. Yeah. And five years from now, hopefully I'm better than I am today. So like that again is that self-driven, like be your own worst critic and be accountable to you like I'm accountable to the studio I work in but I can't let myself down you know what I mean like I that drives me nuts if I if I come home and leave something undone at work it fucks me up it like all night long because I know tomorrow I gotta do that thing well just do it when you're there like get it done I'm not afraid of hard work I guess this <laughs> is, is the the point. Yeah. And, and, and I think that a lot of people like given the opportunity to cut corners, sometimes you cut corners, but over the long haul, maybe that shows and maybe you don't want to be that dude that cuts corners. Um, and I don't want to be known as that guy. So put it all on my shoulders. I'll handle it. Man, this has been a legendary conversation, man. Thank you. Thank you both for the opportunity. Mike, you've worked on some of my favorite records, No Cap, and um, big fan, Dylan. Uh, yes, bro, thank you for everything you do, man. Just got to say that, you know, these opportunities are crazy. And uh, yeah, man, look forward to hearing more stuff, for real. Right on. Hit me up when you're ready to master, man. We'll make it happen. <laughs> I, you, man. I, might, I might have to squeeze a little bit out of the budget from the artist, but uh, I got hey. Things are pliable. I appreciate we'll figure it. Figure it out. LA? Yeah, man. Same. That's Hollywood Gower. Come on by name? when when we're open. Yeah. What's this corona? <laughs> yeah, man. Hey, I appreciate both you guys, man. Thank you so much. I'm about to uh about to get back to work. <laughs> right on, man. Thank you, brother. Take it easy, bro. Take it easy, man. Cool, cool, man. Uh we are running a little short on time. I I, I do got time. We'll, we'll we'll squeeze one more guy in for Q and A. I know he's been in the chat saying he's got a burning question. So let's bring him in. Michael Pagan. Appreciate your time this morning, Mike, man. Oh, man, no worries. Appreciate the gems, man, too. Uh, you do this long enough, you got to have one or two stories. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm getting the video. You can hear me, right? Yes, sir. What's going on, man? Oh, um, nothing much. I don't know how to join the video, but I'll just ask my question while I'm doing this. Okay. Um, cool. If you could explain the expectations and realities versus the competitive side in managing clients like the red flags you see any ways to protect yourself unless you need me to re-explain it no um protect myself from clients i don't know that uh, that i there we go. 
need to per se. Um, like I said earlier, like I'll master for anybody. And I'm, I always make the joke, like if you want to go fart in a box, I'll master your fart in a box. Like <laughs> I'll master any genre and, and I don't pick and choose my clients. Um, I don't have management. My, my clientele is based twofold. One, the studio has a reputation that existed long before I was there. And like I said, I've taken over some of the clients my mentor had, plus built my own client base through other work. Um, but I've never, I've never turned a project away. Um, I'll master any genre. Uh, I can be a little flexible in my cost, but not, not too much. I mean, I'm a hired gun. I, I get a percentage. I, I make a commission, but the studio gets a chunk of that money. So it has to make sense for the studio. I might take a hit if I, you know, it's a friend or, or it's a project I want to, you know, be involved in. But like I was saying earlier, I don't, you, you never know what project's going to blow up and be the best next greatest thing. So I just take everything that comes through the door that I can handle if it works in schedules. Um, a lot of my workload is also determined by the client. Like if they have a deadline of Friday and it's Monday, I know I got to deliver something in the next, you know, couple days if they're going to get it up on a streaming site. Uh, like I did an album last year and I won't throw that artist under the bus either, but like, you know, albums come out Thursday night at 9 PM LA time, midnight East coast time. And this guy's album was supposed to drop on Friday. I didn't get the masters for the album until 11 PM West coast time. So everybody's new release came out and I had like a 20 song album to master before 5 AM Oh wow! and got halfway through it scrapped it, started all over and delivered all those masters by like quarter to five, but I delivered to them and they, you know, I, I always send out a reference and was asking, you know, who's going to prove this? Like, who's going to listen to my mastering to make sure we're good. And they're like, nobody, like whatever you give us is the album. And like, that's crazy pressure. But had I been given the opportunity to say, you know, I don't think that's the smartest move. Yeah, I would have said that, but I also wouldn't have gotten a gig because it came to me knowing that I could, you know, squeeze the blood from the stone, so to speak, and get it done and turned in in time. Um, I don't I don't I don't know that there's a way to protect yourself unless you're talking like financially protect yourself from people. Um, I suppose you could ask for a deposit of a certain amount ahead of, you know, doing the project. I've had people skate on their bills before. I just don't work with them anymore. You know, um, it's a fucked up thing to do. And, and for a while, you know, I would have to charge people, you know, off the top a little bit before I even got started. Now I've kind of figured it out that like, we kind of have a pay as you go type of thing. So if you send me a song to master, I'll master that song. I'll send you a reference to hear. You'll pay for the work done up to that point. Then if you order a master, that's another cost. Um, but there's changes that go in there in between you getting your final master and doing your original mastering. So I collect on that original mastering. So if you take it and run and say, fuck it, I'm not ordering a, a regular master. I'm just going to use this reference and upload it and use that for sale, I'm covered for the work I've done. Um, I mean, it only takes you putting in, you know, a week on an album to have somebody take off on you and not pay you a penny to go, well, that shit ain't gonna happen anymore. And it doesn't hurt me as much as it hurts the studio. And the, and the, the thing that's screwed up is it. most of the squabbles I've had with money were people who have money which is kind of a fucked up thing, but you know, it's also the world we live in. Not everybody is on the up and up, but most people are. And most people, you know, once, once you have a repeat client, you, you're pretty, you're pretty sure they're good to go. You know? Yeah. Thank you for the. Yeah, man. 
I'm hey, gonna let get on here. Appreciate the appreciate the support with the merch too, man. Yeah, I bought two of them. At least had to. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I want my dirty one and my clean one, just for good days. Facts, man. <laughs> Dylan's on the hustle. <laughs> you dig? All right. Hey, appreciate you tapping in, bro. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thanks, bro. Cool, man. Mike, man, uh, I'll say it one more time, man. Appreciate your time this morning. Appreciate you, you know, being an open book and, uh, you know, giving us a little insight into your process, into your world, into your business. And, uh, yeah, man, we definitely got to tap back in. Well, I appreciate it, man. Anytime. Um, thank you for having me, man. Like, again, mastering has always been this weird thing, and now it's starting to get a little bit more light on it, people like you. Um, so I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, follow me on my socials. I, I try and answer DMs if people have questions. I, I don't pimp music out to people, so I don't care. Don't send me your beats. I can't. <laughs> you know, I'm not right, going to go right. play with people. Hey, but send like, this to Kendrick. <laughs> right. But, but like, if you have, you know, just basic questions about mastering and, and I can give you a quick answer, like, again, I, I got to pay back to something that gave me this opportunity, man. Like I, again, I was an uneducated idiot. I'm still just an idiot, but I'm a little more educated on certain things, but like, I want to pay that back. I want, I want us to be listening to dope music forever. So hit me up at master by Mike on the gram. Um, yeah, man. Thanks Dylan for having me, man. This, this was dope. Yes, sir, man. Last question. Uh, if there's anyone that's looking for like, I know, you know, obviously the studio is not really open right now because of COVID and all that, but uh, do you guys ever have intern opportunities? And if so, uh, how, how do they reach out for those? We, we don't really, uh, okay. unfortunately. Um, we never have. Okay. Any, anybody that's got to do a run is usually just, you know, one of the front office people will just step away and go pick up somebody's food. And, and we're not, like I said, we're not like a recording studio. There's not a, a ton of activity per se yeah. um, outside of the room. There's like some common areas, but there's really not much of a need for a runner or an intern yet. Um, I hope that I'm so busy. I need a second someday. And if that ever happens, um, you know, I'll put that out into the world. Um, I hope I get that busy. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Yeah, man, I'll give I'll give advice that I'm sure everybody on this channel has ever given. And that is just get in the door wherever you can get in the door and and just work your ass off. Like if you want it bad enough, you, you'll get there. But it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of sacrifice. And anybody that tells you like there's a quick route to this shit is full of shit. Like. Real quick you got a friend who got on with one song that's like catching lightning in a bottle that's like right. being good enough to be in the pros because that doesn't normally happen and there's a huge infrastructure behind a lot of that to make that happen so like if it doesn't happen immediately stick with it if if you if you stick with it through the hard times it makes the better times that much better and you're going to learn along the way and when that opportunity comes, you're going to step up and you're going to knock it out of the park. So just stick with it, man. Everybody keep working and keep sharing that info. And again, hit me up if I can help out. And Dylan, bro, thank you, man. Anytime you need a stupid mastering guy, call me up. <laughs> Most definitely. <laughs> yeah. Hey, salute to you, man. And I appreciate you one more time and uh, appreciate your time and appreciate the knowledge, man. Yeah, man. My pleasure. Yes, Have sir, a good man. one. You too. Take care. All right, brother. Ooh, switch back hey man appreciate everybody tapping in this morning dope episode man shout out to mike bosey man for the gems uh man we got another week ahead of us man we got we got some other interviews lined up so stay tuned stay, uh, stay tapped into the ig uh you know we'll announce our interviews and everything that we got going on um but yeah shout out to the gang shout out to the early gang and we will be back tomorrow every day monday through friday 10 a.m eastern time on the morning show <laughs>